Hey folks, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're getting ready in today's lecture to put an eagle on the moon. How about that? That's right, we're gonna travel back to the space race and take a look at the mission that the United States went up against the Soviet Union to put a man on the moon, unless you believe it's a big hoax, it's a conspiracy. They're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. How about that? And if that's you, my good friend Mr. B has a new video exploring the moon conspiracy that you probably should check out after this video, and that's gonna be in the description below. And I'm gonna remind you that we're ready to go key up for the learning. So let's go get her done right now. So before we get all rared up to go onto the moon, why don't we do a little contextual drawing for you here? And I would first say thank you, Nazis, because it's really the Nazis that developed the foundations of the technology that both the Soviet Union and the United States are going to use for their own space programs. Um, in the early 1930s, in order to get around the Treaty of Versailles, German scientists started exploring liquid rockets, and it's going to be those scientists that both the Soviet Union and the United States are going to covet at the end of the war. The United States States had what was called Operation Paperclip, and that was to try to entice and take those German scientists onto our side. And we got one of the big ones, the inventor of the V2, Werner von Braun. And he is really going to allow the United States to be quite competitive and eventually win the space race in terms of landing a man on the moon. So at the end of World War II, of course, the Cold War is going to break out and we're really first going to have kind of this competitive race, not in the space area so much, but really with missiles, hydrogen bombs, atomic bombs, intercontinental missiles. But by 1955, this is really where the space race takes off with both the Soviet Union and the United States in the summer of 55 announcing their intentions to launch a satellite. Now, at this point, we didn't have NASA yet. This is still kind of wrapped up in our military, and we're not going to be successful. On October 4th of 1957, the Soviet Union is going to launch Sputnik, a fellow traveler. It weighed 200 pounds. It was like two feet in circumference. And it went beep, 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 beep. And it scared the heck out of us. If you could just imagine, put yourself in that scenario, um, you're already afraid the bombs are going to go off. And suddenly the enemy has a big ball beeping above your country. It was probably a pretty harrowing experience. But not to fear, January of the next year, we're going to launch Explorer 1, our own satellite. But I think that pushed Eisenhower into speeding up the process, and he created what was called NASA, still around with us today. Eisenhower was not a big fan of mixing kind of civilian objectives with military objectives, and he didn't want the military to be in charge of the space program, so NASA was developed. Um, and then from there, we move on. JFK is going to be elected. JFK, not a huge fan of spending money on NASA, actually turned down the first NASA budget. But that's all going to change with Yuri Gagarin on April 12th of 1961, and when he becomes the first person in the world to be out of the world and actually enter space. Now, to be fair, the Soviets didn't bring him back on his own ship, but this is really going to spook JFK um, and humiliate him, I think, to a certain degree. He was already humiliated with the Bay of Pigs, so this was just kind of like, you know, the, the bad cherry on top. I don't know how you say that. But I think mentally that's where JFK decided, um, I don't want to be second anymore. And we were second. May of that very same year, Alan Shepard is going to be launched on Freedom 7, and he's going to come back on the ship, which is pretty cool. But JFK has made the decision that we need to do something bold, and he's going to do it with a speech. So by 1961, JFK, with the help of his vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who had kind of studied this issue, whether we should have the objective of building a space station or putting a man on the moon, JFK makes the decision, putting a man on the moon. May 25th of 1961, the same month that Alan Shepard was launched into space, uh, JFK delivers a very special message to a joint session of Congress. And this is really the moon speech where he lays out the objectives and why it's so important and uh, lays down the line. We're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, which is crazy. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. 
Now, what's interesting is in 1963, shortly before his death, JFK went to the United Nations, I believe September of 63, and gave a speech where he called for a joint mission to the moon with the Soviet Union. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. Now, Khrushchev immediately said no, but recent reports, his son has said that he had changed his mind right before JFK died, and he was willing to do that. But of course, JFK was assassinated, and Khrushchev didn't really like LBJ, so that kind of fell apart. But 1964 is not a great year for the Soviet Union. Um, that's going to be the year that Khrushchev is going to be deposed by Brezhnev, and that's going to put a big hole in their space program for a few years as the United States moves on with Gemini. The Gemini program was to kind of set the stage for the Apollo program, and we were able to do things like put a man in orbit for eight hours, long enough to go to the moon and back, how to dock spaceships, how to rendezvous with ships, how to do work outside the spaceship using modules, all kinds of cool stuff. And as we rock on, we get to the year 1967. Now, 1967 is going to be an important year, not only because we're going to have the Outer Space Treaty uh, to make sure that we're not going to use these space programs to put nukes into space and to threaten the very existence of human society. But it's also the year that I think LBJ is going to double down on the program. Very bad year in Vietnam, and I think that LBJ saw this as an avenue to unite a very divided country. So we're getting ready to go to the moon, and now we're going to do it with the Apollo missions. Here we go. So in 1967, both the Soviet Union and the United States were kind of launching into their own programs. Soyuz was the name of the Soviet Union program, and of course, it was the Apollo program in the United States. And then disaster struck on November 27th of 1967 when the Apollo 1 burned. Um, it wasn't during a mission. They were getting ready for a mission. They were doing exercises, and the three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee, were all on board and they couldn't get the hatch door open and the fire spread and all three tragically died. Not long after, the Soyuz one, one of the Russian cosmonauts, Vladimir Komarov, he also died. So both the Soviet Union and the United States are kind of mirroring themselves in 1967 with tragedy. Now, the Soviet Union was slower to get off the ground. Their N-1 rocket kept failing. That was their most powerful rocket. But the United States was a little bit more successful. And we had uh, subsequently a lot of Apollo missions from 1968 into the summer of 1969 when Apollo 11 is going to launch. But they're going to have subsequent missions, Apollo 8. Apollo 10 that are going to get really close to the moon and get ready for the big one, and that's going to be in the summer, July of 1969 with Apollo 11. Let's go to the moon. So a quarter million miles, what's a big deal? It's only a quarter million miles, and the three astronauts in Apollo 11 are Buzz Aldrin, Mike Collins, and Neil Armstrong, and these guys are going to take off on July 16th of 1969 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's going to take them three days to get to the moon. Um, they actually had a problem. Their computers were overloading because somebody had the antenna switch in the wrong direction, but they eventually figured it out, and it's going to be Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong that are going to descend on July 20th, 1969. Now, they actually landed on the moon about 4.17 Eastern Standard Time, but they stood there for six hours on the Eagle as they waited to get off. Now, of course, we all know Neil Armstrong was the first man off the lunar module. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. I'm going to step off the laminate. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And it's said that one-fifth of the human population, about 723 million people, watched that. Buzz Aldrin is going to follow him out for a little while after, and they're going to spend about two hours and 15 minutes on the surface. Now, interestingly enough, that American flag is gone. What do you think happened to that flag when the lunar module took back off? So that's what it eventually is going to do, is take back off and 
hook itself back up with the Apollo 11 spaceship, Columbia, and they're going to end up landing in the Pacific Ocean. And another fun fact is when they landed in the Pacific Ocean, they were taken to Hawaii. They were taken to the airport where they had to fill out custom forms, and you can see the custom form. It was like destination you came from, the moon. So almost 3,000 days after JFK laid down the gauntlet in May of 1961, we did it in July of 1969, and we're the only ones that did it. Of course, the Soviet Union, they gave up on their moon program and started to heavily invest in their space station program, as the United States is going to do as well. Um, after 1969, we still had Vietnam going on. We had our cities exploding. A lot of people didn't see why we should keep investing and in putting men on the moon, people really didn't see the purpose. But there were follow-ups. Apollo 12 landed on the moon in November of 1969. Um, we all know the story of Apollo 13. That didn't work out very well. Go see the movie with Tom Hanks. But Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17 all landed on the moon. Even Alan Shepard got to walk on the moon. That guy wanted it really bad. We haven't talked about the competition between the astronauts, but it was pretty fierce, that's for sure. I'll tell you another quick story. Ready for this? The three astronauts on Apollo 11, nobody would give them life insurance. <laughs> you probably can figure out why. And actually, the three guys got together before they took off. They spent a day signing signatures just in case all three died so they could sell those signatures for enough money to take care of their families. The more you know. So there you go, guys. We hope that you understand a little bit about the moon landing a little bit more than when you click the button. How about that? And if you're watching the video and you're like, it's a conspiracy, I know it. All I'm going to do is tell you, maybe you should go watch Mr. Beat's video, the new one on the moon conspiracy, where he'll probably give you some things to think about right there. How about that? Down in the description below. And if you're not subscribed to Mr. Beat's channel, I don't know what you're doing. Go check it out right now, down in the description below. Check out Mr. Beat's great content and give him some sub love. All right, guys, I say it at the end of every lecture because I mean it with all my heart, where attention goes, energy flows, and we'll see you guys next time. Did you press the buttons?